uh, which we'll be able to use for all disciplines, for physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, and for all presentations or diagnoses. Um, and so I think Nishi's created a, a wonderful, comprehensive presentation, and just wanted to, to thank her and recognize her for that. Thank you. And if at any point, um, Salima, Ali, and Fazia, if you want to jump in to clarify or anything like that, please do. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and move along. And I, uh, you know, just <laughs> in the interest of full disclosure, everything that's contained in this webinar is from the guide for the uniform set, uh, sorry, data set for medical rehabilitation. It's the 2012 training manual. Uh, I sent that to everybody as well. It's a 200 page plus document. So if there's anything that you know I haven't been able to clarify, feel free to refer to that document because it really gets into all the details. Um, the folks at SIM also want to make sure that we all know that this is a guide that will, you know, is expected to change and to keep up. That's that first page of a website, so we can go ahead and access that. Um, historically. SIM was used as part of inpatient rehab, um, at inpatient rehab facilities, because um, over here it, uh, it, we're able to collect data towards what we call a prospective payment system. And, um, you know, it just, it's basically so that insurance companies get a sense of uh, the patient's status and improvement in an objective manner. And so they know how to pay these hospitals and reimburse them. Um, the coding instructions on the, on the inpatient level is that um, the documentation needs to be completed the day the patient is admitted, day three, and then discharged. And um, if a patient is there for less than three days, then um, the, the documentation will occur on day one and discharge. And anything that is documented at level zero, which means that the activity was not observed, it'll be marked at level one, which is maximum assistance. This will actually make more sense as we progress. Um, but you know, the average inpatient rehab stay here is about 10 to 14 days. And so at the inpatient level, this instrument is designed so that any trained clinician can assign the appropriate level of impairment to any patient. However, you know, more often than not, what we find here is that the physical therapist assigns the appropriate level for their discipline, the occupational therapist assigns the appropriate level for their discipline, and speech uh, therapy for their discipline. And so on weekends here, when there's minimum coverage for these disciplines, usually the nurse assigns the appropriate FIM level, and then by day three, generally all the disciplines are able to update their levels using their expertise. At the outpatient level, um, the level is, you know, we assign these SIM levels the first day that we evaluate the patient, every 10th treatment or 30 days, you know, whichever comes first, and then again at discharge. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to keep moving along then. So the disabilities that are covered in this FIM scale are stroke, uh, brain dysfunction, which includes anything that is uh, non-traumatic brain injury, open brain injury, or a closed head injury as well, uh, neurological conditions, which includes multiple sclerosis, Parkinsonism, uh, any kind of polyneuropathy, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or cerebral palsy. And then spinal cord dysfunction, which includes a paraplegia or a quadriplegia patient. Uh, arthritis, which includes both rheumatoid as well as osteoarthritis. Uh, and then we'll go on to this next one. And then it also covers orthopedic disorders, which includes hip fractures, hip replacement, pelvic fractures, knee fractures, mm -hmm. knee replacement. Uh, as well as cardiac disorders, of course. And under pulmonary disorders, that includes COPD as well. Um, and then the rest of burns, congenital deform deformities, and then other disabling impairments. Multiple, major multiple trauma refers to brain and spinal cord, or brain and multiple fracture, 
or spinal cord and multiple fractures. So just more issues and then uh, developmental disability as well. Next page. Debility and then any kind of medically complex conditions, which really means the FIM scale really encompasses you know, almost any diagnosis. Um, and then in the manual, you can look under each of these sections for any kind of detailed diagnosis. Are we doing okay so far? Does anybody have anything to add or any questions? I think we are doing okay so far. Okay, wonderful. How about on the IHPA team? Anybody have anything to add? No, everything is good. Okay, great. We'll just keep moving along. So the underlying principle for FIM is that it's a basic indicator of severity of disability and that really it's designed so that it can be administered really quickly and you know generate a great deal of data as well. Now what we notice and what we see of course with rehab is that as the severity of the disability changes during rehab, the data generated by the FIM instrument can be used to track these kind of changes and then as Ali mentioned, you know, it really, it's a really effective outcome measure. So a patient may come in, you know, and especially folks who've had strokes, and they'll come in and they'll change their locomotion status often from wheelchair to walking within 10 days of rehab. And so the scale allows us to track these changes and then of course is used objectively as an outcome measure. So the basic principles again is that there is a seven level scale with, um, well it's actually eight technically, zero is more, is used when the activity is not observed, or it's not, sorry, is, is not done. So you know a lot of times when folks come in, we don't look at them on stairs right away. So that would be zero. But then one is that they need maximum assistance, and then seven is that they're independent. And so basically, the seven level scale designates the uh, difference in behavior from dependence, which is level one, to independence, level seven. And the scale rates patients on their performance of an activity, you know, taking in account their need for assistance from another person or a device. And so then if help is needed, the scale quantifies that need. And the need for assistance, or you know, we call it burden of care, what it, what it translates into is the time or energy that another person must expend to serve the dependent needs of this disabled individual um, so that they can have this uh, patient can achieve and maintain a certain quality of life. The key with this FIM scale, and it sounds really easy, but it can get really uh, confusing at times, is that we need to th look at it from the patient's perspective and how much the patient is able to do. And that's how we assign uh, what, what scale they're on. Um, all right. So, um, and just to clarify that it's a measure of the disability and not impairment. What I really mean, and we kind of use the term impairment and diagnosis, but what we really do is that we measure what the person with the disability actually does, not what they ought to be able to do. So, for example, you know, a person who's depressed, you know, they could do many things um, that they're not currently doing. However, the person should be assessed on the basis of what he or she actually does. And so the other piece of this to remember as well is that if there's a difference in function that occurs in different environments or different times of the day, we need to record the lowest, the most dependent score. Um, but actually going back, sorry, to, to circumstances, I just also wanted to clarify that, you know, the patient score um, a function shouldn't reflect any arbitrary limitations that the facility or you know circumstances the facility may impose. For example, you know a patient who can you know routinely walk more than 150 feet throughout the day with supervision, which is a score of five on FIM for locomotion, um, but at the time who may be observed to ambulate only 20 feet at night to use the toilet because that's the distance from his or her bed, um, that person should really receive a walk score of five rather than a lower score um, because, you know, it's just the nature of the restroom being so close to the bed and not so much what a patient can do. So, you know, on item number two where it reads if differences in function occur in different environments or at different times of the day, 
you know, the recommendation SIM has to record the lowest score, but again, we don't want to assign a low score to this person just because the toilet is very close by. Um, all right. And we're going to go ahead and move on to 11. Underlying principles, discipline. Sorry, yes? Yeah, Nancy and Salima, if I could interject. So just to clarify, though, if, if when the person is fatigued, they are a lower score, you're going to record the lower score, not really based on distance because that's all you observe, but you're going to, you're, if, if during the day the person has different needs because of fatigue, because of their illness, sundowner syndrome, whatever it might be, you are going to take the lowest score, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Thank you. That's exactly right. I used to, what, what you're saying basically is that uh, if you want to perform uh, the assessment and you go to the patient, the patient tells you that he's tired or he's not feeling right, uh, you don't go ahead with the test or uh, you go ahead with the test and then you comment down that the patient was tired or was fatigued. That's correct. You do the assessment and score them where they are on that assessment and then you know, you'll see that many of these assessments will have a comment line and you can put the comment in, but they're definitely going to need a score because that's what they can do at that time. Correct. Okay. So if it's for the insurance purposes and uh, you, you present that report, would it, will it not affect the outcome of the, the, the whatever the assessment from insurance or the, the clinician so far? You know, the hope is that, um, that we'll be able to measure a change that over time as you work with the patient, however long they're in your program, that you'll be able to document that, um, you know, you work on endurance, in improving endurance. So perhaps the first day they can walk 20 feet, even if it's fatigue or whatever, for whatever reason. But then as you work with them, let's just say when you take this assessment on day three, that, you know, hopefully they'll have increased their endurance and they can move up in the scale. Does that make sense? Does anybody in PT, Fauzi, or Ali, Salima want to add anything? I, I it's a bit clearer for me, no? Does that does that help, um, Michael? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah. Okay. But uh, just further to his question, you're gonna you have to document the most assistance that they're going to need because that's that's going to be at any time the patient is going to be judged on if they're let's say for discharge are they prepared for discharge? Well, if, if the person during you know from 8 a.m. to 12 is independent but then needs help after that, you can't have them discharged without the care they need. So you have to document the highest level of assistance that they need so that you can prepare for discharge planning. Nishi, would you agree? Agree, yes. And actually, you know, uh, caregivers have a better idea too because they'll know that, okay, for example, you know, this person can only walk 20 feet or they can walk 150 feet but, oh, they need me to help, uh, you know, with steadying assistance. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Nishi. Yes. Yeah? Uh, I'm glad to report that uh, the OT, Edith, has joined us at this oh, point. Oh, welcome. Welcome, Edith. Welcome to our team. We have Ali, Salima, and Fauzia on the line from our end here in the United States, and um, uh, Vidya, Mercedes, and Fatuma from uh, Dar on the line as well. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Um, okay, so the next slide that we're on it reads, Underlying Principles, Discipline Free. And you know, the whole idea about it is that with the way the scale is laid out, anyone can really um, come in and measure each person on any of the levels. However, you know, in my experience in the hospitals here and even in outpatient settings especially, is that each discipline really manages their own um, assessments, you know, and give scores. So, for example, as a speech therapist, I don't give a score for PT areas in general because I know that we've got a physical therapist on staff that will do that. Um, and so, as you look at like the different 18, you know, the 18 items, you're going to, you know, although any of us can assess in those areas, you know, we find that those that have the specialties, they're the ones who do it. So for example, myself, I didn't generally assess all the communication items. A nurse who is more knowledgeable with respect to bowel and bladder management will assess those areas. 
a physical therapist who has the expertise to evaluate transfers will do that, and an occupational therapist who scores self-care. And, you know, between occupational therapy and speech therapy, we take care of the cognition items as well. All right. So to be categorized at any given level, the patient must complete either all of the tasks included in the definition or only one of several tasks. This is going to actually make more sense as we actually talk about case studies. But the key here is really take a look at the definitions. And what we really want to take a look at is, is our patient able to perform these activities with a reasonable amount of safety? You know, and just to review with the scale, um, one is that they need maximum assistance. And then with respect to level six, which is just a sort of modified independence, you know, what we really want to ask ourselves is, is our patient at risk of hurting themselves again when performing a task? And so this is the only part of it that does use judgment is that, you know, you, we really need to take into account the balance between what is the individual's risk if they participate in an activity, and then what other associated risk if they don't participate in the activity, you know. All right. So in terms of scoring specifics, you're going to see that under locomotion for FIM, the FIM item, walk, there's two options, walk or wheelchair. And so they must be the same on admission and at discharge as well. And so now a lot of the forms are modified because some patients, especially, you know, stroke folks, you know, they may change their mode of locomotion from admission to discharge. Usually they're in a wheelchair and then they go to walking. And so in those cases, we need to code the admission mode, so if that's wheelchair, and then score based on the more frequent mode. So sometimes folks go home on a wheelchair as well as walking. And so you need to take a look at what are they doing more often. And like I said, with a lot of these, they have a line for walking as well as wheelchair. So you're able to score accordingly. All right. Okay. When the assistance of two helpers is required for the patient to perform any kind of task in an item, you will always give them a score level of one, which is total assistance. Um, if a thin activity does not occur at the time of discharge, you would record a score of one total assistance. So what that means is sometimes, uh, you know, in the area of physical therapy, uh, stairs are not assessed because, or they, you know, they're not relevant to the patient because they live in like a one-bedroom flat where they really wouldn't, or like on a main level where there are no stairs. In which case, it may not be completely accurate, but the recommendation is to score total assistance of one. Um, if the patient expires while in rehab, we would record a score of level one for all discharge items. Insurance companies like to know that information as well. Um, now, one of the other items in terms of just scoring and getting an understanding of you know, where the patient is at, before we record a code of zero, the whoever is completing the assessment, it's really recommended that they consult with other clinicians, um, the medical record, the patient, the patient's family members to um, determine whether the patient did perform or was observed to be performing the activity. You know, um, we're encouraged to not use zero just because we didn't observe the patient activity. You know, we only do it if the activity did not occur. Just because we didn't see it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Okay, so now we... Um, we're going to go ahead and refer to the manual. So I'm going to try and call that up there because this is where we're going to break down everything into, um, you know, how does this work. So if you just give me a moment, I'm going to call up that manual right now.
But use the code only when the activity did not occur. Let's say, for example, a component size. You go to a very weak Then, to Jarib, you No, it did not But we tried. But you cannot, you cannot try it as you don't the scale. You don't even understand. There is no zero. It has to start from code one. From it has one. to start from one. Yeah. But it's so if you ask the patient to do something, I'm mean, sure put this side. The way I understand it, mm -hmm. is that you should not say it's a zero. So what you should do? So what will you? Do? Yeah. 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 Less than Maybe. Less than no. Because that patient tried and not achieved. That will be it. Yeah. 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 One, yeah. yeah. But no, so, I, when somebody is reporting an activity, yes. you're being told that this patient today tried to fit, but you are not there. Yes. How should you report that? But can you, can, can you, you assess, can you assess yeah. what you're not seeing? Mm -hmm. Miss is saying that you've not seen so, you are there with the patient that you tried. And so the according to the same way, we can go and do it with a small dog, a machine. So there are zero. So that's what I'm but why, 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 why are they saying that only indicate it? No, no. your statement. You see, no, no. how mm -hmm. E1, mm -hmm. E1, 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 total assistance subject less than 25%. So if it's less than 25%, then it shows even zero. It's still <laughs> one. The level it's still one. one. Zero. All right. Can we see this? Uh, are you able to see this on your screen where it reads description of the levels of function and their score? Nishi? Yes? Nishi, uh, our colleagues have a question here, please. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, Nishi, this is Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Uh, I want to ask concerning the scoring specific. Sure. Prior to recording a code zero. Correct, uh-huh. I needed some clarification that in the event that you try like to stand a patient and the patient can't be able to stand. Okay. In the in the statement here it's saying that you only use the code when the activity did not occur. Right. But according to the assessment scale, I can see that less than twenty five, so even if it's zero, you just call it one. So when do you actually use that code zero? Um so my understanding of this is that um, if you attempt to do the activity, you know, uh, you just mentioned that you would help them stand up, then it would be a one. Um, uh, but if you don't even make that attempt, or then it, you would code it as a zero, just for that initial one. Does that make sense? But you have tried to lift the, or you know get the patient to stand up, and they're you know they they need all your help then it would be scored as a one. But if you did not even get the patient to step, then that would be when it would be a zero. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, does that help? So right now on your screen, are you able to see description of the levels of function and their score? Yes. Who can say yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. So this is going to get into a little bit more of the, <laughs> the meat of the matter here. So independent is when the person can do, can do the activity by themselves, there's no helper. Okay? Complete independence is that the patient safely performs all of the tasks described as making up the activity within a reasonable amount of time and that they can do it without any assistive devices or aids. So you know this refers to they don't need a walker, they don't need a, um, a cane, uh, for a speech, they don't need a reacher, they don't need any, any kind of other assistive equipment. Modified independence is that they're able to do the activity independently, but they need a little bit of help or they need a device. So one or more of the following may be true. The activity requires an assistive device or aid, so that could be again a walker, a cane, or the more than reasonable time, or the activity involves safety risk or consideration. So if it takes somebody 
a longer time than you would expect to go from sitting to standing and they need the assistance of a, a walker to do it, then you would score them a six. Um, and then the next level is dependent, which is the person requires another person to either supervise or they require physical assistance to perform the activity where it's not performed. Um, so even within this section, there are three levels. So if the patient, and again, it's from the perspective of what the patient can do. So if they can do 50% or more of the effort, then the below is, you know, the lower is the assistance required. So for level five, they would just need somebody to just help them set up, whether it's cueing to be able to say, oh, you know, don't forget to lock your wheelchair and put your hands on the armrest before you stand up. Or, but there's no actual physical contact. Everything can be done without um, you actually touching the patient. So for occupational therapy, you know, when it comes to eating, it would be maybe even just help opening up containers. But they can eat by themselves, but they just need someone to help, you know, set up their tray. Um, and then minimal assistance is that the patient does at least 75% or more of the effort and they no, don't need any more help rather than, you know, except for touching. And then moderate is that the patient requires more help and that the patient's able to do 50 to 74%. In the event that they can't, that's when you move into kind of the more complete dependence area where the patient can only do less than 50% of the work. And so maximum assistance is that they can do 25 to 49% of the effort and total assistance is that the patient expends less than 25% of the effort. I'm going to go on to the next page because this is the decision tree. And this is the general decision tree. And then actually there's even more trees for the next oh, about 50 pages for each specific SIM scoring area. Are we doing OK so far? Yes. yes. OK, so let's go on. And we're on the page that reads instructions for the use of the FIM decision trees. Okay, so again, you know, the start, you're, the first question you're going to say is, does the patient need help? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, then your question then you ask yourself is, does the patient need more than enough, you know, reasonable time, or is there a device, or is there a safety concern? And then you would score, and if it's, the answer is no, they're fine, then they're, the score is seven. And if the answer is yes, then they would be scored as a modified independent person. So this would, like I said, be, you know, it would need, do they need a cane? Do they need any device? Now, if you ask yourself, does the patient need help and the question is yes, then you know that you need a helper. That, you know, really determines also just your plan of care as well for discharge. You know, is this person going to need supervision at home? And so, again, the tree goes to, you know, your question is, does the patient do half or more? And so then if it's yes, they do half or more, then you need to be able to look at the patient and say, okay, can I just talk this patient through it? Or if I open up some containers or if I give them, you know, some modified utensils, are they able to do what they need to do? And if the answer is yes, where they just need somebody watching them, their score would be five. If the answer is no, then you need to kind of take a look at what kind of assistance do they need. Is it about 50%? And then you would score them you know, uh, sorry, if it's 75 percent, then it would be more of a 50 to 75 percent, sorry, it would be a more moderate assistance. And then if they need, if the patient's able to do more than 75, then it would be minimal assistance. So those are the level three and four scores. Now, if you ask yourself, does the patient do half or more of the effort, and the answer is no, then you need to kind of determine, well, what kind of assistance do they need? Do they need total assistance? Well, then it would be one. Or is the patient able to do 25 to 49 percent? So this is kind of a tree that, you know, I, I know in my initial training, I, I would come back to this tree all the time just to remind myself of what the patient's able to do. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? No question. No question so far? Okay. Um, 
Okay, now I'm getting feedback saying the font is too small. Is this a little bit better? This is about as big as I can get, I think. Fatuma, is this better? You can text me if it is. Yes, okay. Yes? Irene has a question. Sure. Um, I have a question. Yes, I when you When you are transferring a paraplegic patient yes. from a... Yes from a bed to a chair, yeah. and then you, when he helps with the both hands, eh? mm -hmm. which level is that? What, what level can you put that? Okay, um, you know, Faz, Ali, or Selena, would you be able to help with that question? Pardon? I, I'm just, uh, asking physical therapists on the team what their thoughts are. Sorry, could you repeat? Irene, can you repeat yeah. the question, please? Is I was asking, asking if you're sorry, sorry. Go on, I'm sorry. Um, I was asking if you are transferring a paraplegic patient, huh? and the patient has power muscle power grade five or four on the upper limbs. Uh, moving the patient from the bed to a chair, what level is that? Can you put it as moderate assistance or? Um, so, so the answer is. Um, defined by how much body weight you're actually lifting, huh. right, so of how much effort that patient is able to give. So even if, for example, some patients are able to use their upper extremity strength to, to raise themselves up and, and um, you know, if the bars are at a proper height, then they might be able to hold themselves up in the air um, for, for the transfer. But in this case, it depends upon actually how much strength and how much effort those uh, upper extremities are able to give to that patient. You would you would uh, define the answer based on how much percentage of body weight uh, you're actually lifting, or the patient's actually lifting. Okay. So I I also have a question on that uh, aspect. Huh? Mm -hmm. Our objective is uh, the percentage because if I'm assisting a patient, the my perception of uh, fifty percent might be different from Irene's perception of fifty percent. So if I'm scoring that patient. Uh, do I just put what I have, or is there another uh, standardized scale whereby you're able to, if I say it's 50%, then the fellow therapist who comes also assumes or finds it as 50%, mm -hmm. as yeah, a level of assistance. And uh, so, you know, Mr. McCall, this is actually the number one question about the functional independence measure, is how do we standardize, uh, you know, the, the numbers between therapists? and in this case, um, it requires a bit of practice because you might have a patient who's 100 pounds versus a patient who's 150 pounds or, you know, 40 kilos versus 80 kilos. Um, and <clears throat> in that case, it's a matter of not the therapist's perspective, but try to make it not the case of the therapist's perspective, but more so uh, the actual amount of body weight that, uh, the, lift, that uh, the therapist is lifting. So. It requires a little bit of practice to say, all right, if it's requiring me this much effort, then I'm lifting 40 kg. Or if I'm putting this much effort, it's requiring me to lift 25 kg. Um, and so that's where a little bit of practice comes in to try and standardize it. Would, would the rest of the team agree? Agree. And you know, initially when we're assigning these levels, I really recommend if you can just pull in a colleague real quick and just say, you know, I am... I, um, you know, I would score this patient as moderate assistance. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. If you're able to do... I, I don't know what the rest of the team thinks, but when you're doing this, if you start to think about, as you're planning for this patient, what, what information am I going to have to give about that person's continued care? So if you're thinking about perhaps a gentleman who had a stroke who needs to go home with his wife or something, and you're trying to say, how much assistance? So as therapists, yeah, we get caught up. You're probably a lot stronger than that wife. So, you know, it could get con convoluted that way. But you have to think, if I'm scoring them on these, what kind of assistance am I going to put for this wife before they go home? So you want to also think along those lines in terms of the assistance. And if you think from that perspective, I think the numbers get a little easier when you're saying minimal, moderate, you know, what, what you're looking for somebody else to be able to provide for that person. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. 
wonderful. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, sorry, I know that it seems like I'm scrolling this very quickly, but I'm trying to go to sections that are relevant for us. And so let's go ahead and um, uh, just keep moving along. And I'm going to maybe go towards uh, eating and toileting and some of, or sorry, um, I'm just going to keep moving along here. Give me just a minute. All right. The first section is that uh, eating. This eating, and so eating includes the use of being able to use the right utensils to bring food to the mouth, chewing and swallowing. And at level seven, the patient can eat from a dish while managing all consistencies of food and drinks from a cup or a glass with the meal presented, you know, in a customary manner on a table or tray. So the question you're going to ask yourself is, does the patient need help when eating meals or administering this refers to if they have like a, a G tube or a, you know a peg. Um, are they able to, if they are not eating by mouth, are they able to hook up their own uh, feeding tube to you know the food, the liquid food? And so if the answer is they do not need help, then you want to, the question you ask yourself is do they need an assistive device to eat? Um, and so that could refer to for occupational therapy. You know, do they need weighted utensils to eat? You know. Um, does he or she take more than the reasonable amount of time to eat? Is there a safety concern? You know, do they need a modified food consistency? Um, or are they able to, you know, administer their tube feeds? And if it's that they're fine, then the score is seven and they're independent. And if they need some of these utensils or some kind of setup help, then um, actually it's not setup help. I'm sorry. If they need um, uh, modified food consistency, then it would be a score of six. Now, in the event that they don't need help, sorry, if they do need help with eating meals, then the question again is, does the patient perform half or more of the eating tasks? And if the answer is yes, then it's the whole idea behind, do they just need setup assistance? Do they need cueing to remind them to slow down when they're eating? Do they need help with just opening containers or just pouring liquids or spreading butter? And if the answer is yes, then they would have a score of five. And if it's no, that they, they need more than just somebody watching them, then, you know, you ask yourself, does a patient need help, such as putting utensils in their hand or helping them scoop the food onto their fork or spoon? And if they just need incidental help, you know, um, if they're able to do it 75% or more of the time, then it would be minimal assistance. If they need help, if they're able to do it 50 to 74 percent of the time, then that's moderate assistance. And then the next, and then let's just say they're not able to perform more than half of the eating tasks. Then you want to take a look at: Do they need? Are they able to do 25 to 49 percent, or do they need a hundred? You know, help less than 24. Sorry, if they, the patient is able to do less than 25 percent, then they need total assistance. So far, so good. Yep. Yes. All right. So for grooming, and this is where you know the thin scale is really. I mean, very, sorry, uh, yes. let me see if I can yes. do that. Yes, please. Uh -huh. For a moment here. Uh, so for Mr. Raquel's question, <clears throat> the fact that there are ranges here that uh, improves the the interrater reliability a little bit and the intraorator um, uh, reliability, uh, because you have that range, that means that let's say if there's a 10 kg difference between one person versus another. Uh, then they usually will fall within that same range, and so that's why uh, this is, you know, considered the world standard in um, in this uh, type of objective outcome measure. Is that fair? Could you come up again, please? Oh, sure. Uh, so what I'm saying is, because each of these scores, each of these numbers, is a range uh, that improves the reliability of the measure. So, for example, let's say uh, Macau and Ali are both lifting um, uh, Nishi, and uh, you know we, we get about a, a five kg difference from when Macau lifts Nishi and Ali lifts Nishi. Uh, however, we'll both probably be able to place her within the same category or same range, or let's say like 25 to 49 percent of her body weight, um, because that five kg difference will not make that much of a difference as far as changing the actual score. Do you know what I mean? 
Yes. Yeah, makes sense. And so in that way, that's what I'm saying. It improves the reliability of the measure so that we'll probably end up with the same score even if, for example, you have uh, somebody who, a therapist who, for example, is much lighter and more petite than a much larger therapist. Um, you might have a larger discrepancy in the actual amount of weight lifted by that therapist. However, the the score is a range, and so that range is large enough to to improve the reliability. Yeah, that makes sense now. Okay. okay. So what we'll do now is we will just choose maybe one more OT area and then get into some of the physical therapy areas. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about grooming. Grooming includes oral care, hair grooming, so either combing or brushing their hair, washing the hands, washing the face, and either shaving the face or applying makeup. If the subject neither shaves nor applies makeup, then grooming only includes the first four tasks. Um, and the patient performs the activity safely, and the item includes obtaining any kind of articles that you need for grooming. So actually, I think it's best now to go to the decision tree and work our way through this instead of you know, breaking it down up ahead. So if the patient needs help when brushing their teeth or combing their hair, washing their hands, shaving their face, and either shaving or applying, sorry, washing face, and either shaving or applying makeup, if the answer is they do not need help, then you need to take a look at do they need any assistive devices like an adapted comb, or do they take a long time? And if they're able to do things in an efficient manner, within reasonable time, then it would be seven and they're completely independent. If it takes them a longer time, or they need some kind of adaptation for grooming, then the score would be modified independent. They're able to do it on their own, they just need more time or they need a device. Now, in the event that they do need help brushing their teeth, combing their hair, um, and brushing their uh, hair as well, or washing their hands, washing the face, or shaving, or applying makeup, then you'd go into the helper section and decide, does a patient perform half or more of these tasks? Or, and then if the answer is yes, then you want to take a look at, do they just need supervision? So do, do they just need to have their toothbrush, toothpaste, and their razor set out for them, and then they can do it on their own? Um, or then it would be yes, but then if they need more than just um, that setup and they need, and if the patient's able to do 75% or more, then they would be scored a four. And then if the patient is only able to do 50 to 74%, then that would be a score of three. And so that'll let you know for, you know, for moderate or minimal assistance. And then if the answer to your question is that the patient performs less than 50%, then you need to decide, you know, are they able to do 25 to 49%, then you would give them a 2, but if they're able to only do 25% or less, then you would give them a score of 1. So far so good? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and move our way over to um, a couple of physical therapy tasks. And then um, I'm hoping we can squeeze in at least one case study before the end of our session. So far, anybody have anything to add from our IHTA team or anybody have any questions on the other end? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go ahead. We're at page 71, and it's titled Transfers, Bed, Chair, or Wheelchair. So this includes all aspects of transferring from a bed to a chair and back, or from a bed to a wheelchair and back, or coming to a standing position if walking is the typical mode of locomotion. All right. And let's go ahead and go to the decision tree over here. So um, at level seven, as the uh, subject approaches, sits down, and gets up to a standing position from a regular chair, transfers from bed to chair. Um, if they perform it independently and safely, then that would be a seven. If the patient is in a wheelchair and approaches the bed or chair, is able to lock the brakes, 
lift the foot rest and you know, remove the armrest if needed and is able to perform either a standing pivot or sliding transfer without a board, uh, then they, that would also be um, a level seven if they're independent and safely, if they're doing it independent and safety. Safety, yeah. Sorry. So if the activity doesn't occur, then on you know, admission it would be a zero uh, and a one on discharge. Pardon me, I just have a question here. Um, uh, Vidya needs clarification on percentage division. I'm just going to ask her to um, to clarify that. Sorry, I'm just trying to respond right now to um, Fatuma's text. I think what about this percentage is yeah. the percentage division. So what Michelle was saying, yeah. if the patient you find that the patient is scoring between fifty to seventy four, yeah. then you classify oh, yes. that one as more than yeah. yeah. She needs yeah. because she has explained that. Okay. So Fatuma, um, I hope this is helpful for you and Vidya. So in terms of just a quick review of um, the percentage effort put in by the patient, uh, if the patient is independent and no helper is needed, then they would be seven or six. And then in terms of the exact percentage breakdown at the dependent levels, a five would be um, if the person just needs supervision or setup help, minimal assistance is that the patient does 75% or more of the effort. Moderate assistance is that the patient expends between 50 and 74. And then maximum is that the patient expends between 25 and 49%. And then total assistance is that the patient only expends less than 25%. Um, this is on page 47. I'm just going to type that in there because you know, it's a really good question and all these numbers can, you know, kind of get all mixed up at times. Um, does that answer your question, Fatuma? Sorry, I'm just waiting for her to respond via text. Oh dear. Okay, so the question is, how do we judge 50 or 75 F percent effort for a given task. Ali, Salima, or Fazia, can you respond to this one? Can you want to take this one, or Fazia? Fazia? Nishi, Nishi, can, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was on mute. Can you repeat the question? Sure. It's how do we judge 
50 or 75 percent effort for a given task. You were repeating on body weight. I, yeah, exactly. Okay, sorry, Ali, can you repeat that, please? Uh, we're, we're basing we're basing it on body weight, body weight. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Is it just the therapist's judgment, or is there a set criteria for it? No, there's, there's a set criteria. So you want to take the patient's weight. Um, and then determine how much of that body weight is actually being lifted by the patient, right? And and that determines your level of effort. So 100% so effort is 100% of the patient's body weight being lifted, and then you go down based on the percentages thereafter. Sorry, I'm just typing your response to them. Well, I think you're okay, Nishi, because they can hear you. Oh, all right. It's just okay. you can hear them. Yeah. Right, okay. Okay. Okay, so I got it. Got it. Okay, let's go ahead and go to transfers. All right, and so, um, gosh, where were we? Okay, I think we talked about, um, we were at the helper stage. So does the patient perform half or more of the effort for wheelchair training? And then if the answer is yes, then you need to decide do they just need supervision, at which point it would be five, or do they need what we call contact, or I guess what you call contact guard assistance, or steadying. And if that's all you need, this middle where the patient does 75% or more of the work, then it would be four, and then if the patient does 50 to 75, 74% of the efforts, and that's moderate assistance. In the event that the patient does not perform half or more of the effort for bed, chair, or wheelchair transfers, then you need to decide, does the patient require total assistance for the bed, chair, wheelchair, such as like the helper doing the lifting or using a mechanical lift? And if the answer is no, if the patient does 25 to 49%, then that's maximum assistance. And then if the patient does 25% or less of the effort, then that's total assistance. All right, does that make sense? Shall we move along? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's go ahead and maybe what we can do is we can do one more PT item. And then let's maybe, you know, go ahead and go to a case study if we can. Let's go ahead and do locomotion. Okay, so there's two sections to this. There's a walk section and then a wheelchair section. And walk includes walking on a level surface once in standing position, and the patient performs the activity safely. All right, so it's either do they do it with no helper, which is complete independence, they can walk a minimum of 150 feet or 50 meters without assistive devices, and they're safe. That would be scored a seven. Modified independence is that the patient walks a minimum of 150 feet or 50 meters but uses a brace or prosthesis, uh, special adaptive shoes, a cane, crutches, or a walker, or takes more than a reasonable amount of time to complete the activity or if there's any safety issues with balance. Five. Um, is, you know, refers to uh, if the patient can only walk short distances of 50 to 15 meters, sorry, 50 feet to 15 meters independently with or without a device. And so that really just refers to in, just in the house, all right? Um, so a, you would score a patient level five if they need supervision, which is they just need someone standing beside them. They're not touching them. They're just standing beside uh, cueing them or, you know, just kind of encouraging them to go at least 150 feet. Minimal assistance is that the patient can do 75% or more of the walking effort. Um, moderate assistance is that they are able to do 50 to 74% to go 150 feet. Maximum is that 
they're able to, um, the patient performs 25 to 49 percent of walking effort to go a minimum of 50 feet and then requires one person to help them. Total assistance is that the patient performs less than 25 percent of effort or requires two people or walks less than 50 feet or 15 meters. Um, and then zero, of course, is if the activity doesn't, uh, doesn't um, occur. Um, and so for locomotion, there's actually two identifiers. One is, of course, walk or wheel, and walk, and the other one is wheelchair. And so again, they need to be the same on admission and discharge. And most of these forms will have a little W for you know walk, um, or they'll do like a WC for wheelchair, where you can you know um, you can put down where they are at which level. Um, and so if we go ahead and look at page 80, there's the uh, decision tree on that as well. And I'll just have you take a look at it for a moment while I go ahead and I, you know, I think that we can go ahead and load up a case study. What do you think? Yes. Okay. So I'll have you go ahead and look at that right now. And in case the screen um, goes blank for some reason, we're looking at page 80 of 169. <laughs> Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Nishi? Yes? Irene has, Irene has a question uh, about locomotion. Okay, sure thing. Go ahead, proceed. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, Nishi? Yes? I'm going to give an example with a, uh, my patient who has Parkinsonism. Okay. Um, normally when she walks, she has that fear of fall, so we normally, I normally use two therapists, myself and another therapist, just to stand beside her as she walks, because she has that fear of fall. But she's able to walk up to 50 meters if we, the two of us were there. So where would you put that? Is it moderate assistance or which level is that? So my Bitcoin. No problem, no. That's a very good question. And so does she, when you're walking with her, does, do you touch her when you walk with her? No, I don't touch her. The only thing that makes her walk confidently is when we are two therapists standing beside her because she has that fear of fall and then she tends to get shaky a bit. Um, okay, Salvia, do you want to respond to this in terms of just what, what would we assign, what level would we assign? Hmm? Lima, are you there too? I'm just going to defer this to our PTs. Yes. 
Well, I would say that, um, you know, she's, she's not, you wouldn't score her seven because she's not fully independent. She needs somebody, to, she needs something. She's not locking on her own. Um, I, if you were going to go down the list, you'd go to six and say six is, you know, she needs some sort of aid or some sort of, um, you know, uh, is she wearing a special shoe or something like that. So that's not the case in this either. Um, however, I would call that modified. I would, it would be a toss-up between five and six for me. Um, Ali, would you agree, Salima? Um, Ali has stepped away, but I'm wondering, Sal, if it's more of a five because somebody needs to be close to her, otherwise she's not going to block. You know what I mean? So she needs that. Right. right? Yeah, my inkling would be to go with five. Mm -hmm. No, we're not using these, but we're just five. Yeah. But you score five. That's Correct. Right. Pardon? Yes, correct. It would be a five because somebody's got to stand by. I think the second you need to put a hand on her, to whether it's steadying, any of that, then it becomes more of a four. But because she's not doing it on her own and she needs someone around, it would be a five. Have you tried it with just one person? Yeah, with one person, she, she, can, she cannot go to 50 meters with one person because she's scared. It's like she's not confident if I'm one person. Right. So sorry. Now that's actually a really good point that you just brought up where it's 50 meters. So Thaz, that would be a little bit different. Wouldn't you agree that 50 meters, um, where does that fall in? Hold on. I need to get my scale on physical therapy in front of me. Sorry, Nisha, I lost you for a second. Can you repeat that? Yeah. yeah, do you have the decision tree in front of you? With Because um, she walks 50 meters. It's not 150 meters. It's 5-0, not 1-5-0. So what level is that? Sorry, I'm just going back to my locomotion. No, Nishi, it's 150 feet or 50 meters. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Thank you for clarifying. Sorry for the confusion. So, yeah, level 5. So it's level 5. Correct. Okay. Even if we are two therapists. Yeah, I mean... Even if you're two therapists, but both the therapists aren't touching her. So really, it's stand by a suit. Uh, Nisha, I have a, I have a, I have a question. Sure. Uh, my question is, uh, this patient, uh, when Irene is alone, it's not that she will not walk 50 meters, she will actually not walk at all. Okay, so it's a question of uh, the confidence uh, that she can walk. If there are not two people, she will not walk. She will not walk one meter. Mm -hmm. this is a it's, tough a really good, it's a really tough uh, situation because this doesn't really take into account the patient's confidence. Um, it's more, the scale is more d dealing with their ability. And so I understand how it's a difficult situation to score it. Um, and you know, as long as you guys are consistent and you're, you make a decision about this and then stick to it and everybody understands it. So I'm wondering though, if this patient will not move at all, then, and the scale is based on the patient's ability and not like what their potential is, then would they be scored lower because if she's not there, they won't do it. Yeah, I know it's a really tough one. Um, I would agree that I would score a little bit lower only because if we're thinking about the caregiver and what kind of care she's going to need, um, you know, it's it's not really a five. Right. So, Does, have you tried it, Irene, with a, with a, a caregiver there? You have tried it. Have you tried to have like this patient's family member beside them to do it? She has a caregiver. Yeah, she has a caregiver. We okay. tried once, only once, because I was encouraging the caregiver to normally make her work at home. But she also reported the same that even if they walk, she has to hold her hand because she's only one person. Um, can I ask a couple more questions about this patient? Um, is she yes, said she had a neurological disease? 
Yeah, she has Parkinson's in yes. And what is what is the reason for her to be in the hospital? She's, she's an outpatient. She's an outpatient. Oh, she's an she outpatient. She comes as an outpatient, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So she comes in a wheelchair? No, she walks using a roller walker. But how does she walk if, like, you said you need two people to walk with her, so when she's coming to the department, yeah. walking in, she walks to the when department she, with, a care, with a caregiver? When she comes to the department, she walks with the roller walker and the caregiver holds her hand also. She uses both the roller walker and the caregiver is uh, beside her. Okay, so then that's one person beside her. Yes. And then you know she she get, she gains the confidence because she has the walking device and the caregiver is there. Oh, okay. So with a rolling walker and one person, she's okay to walk. Yes. So but you you're saying when she comes, to... yeah. Huh? When when she comes, what I usually try to do is try to make her walk independently without the device. Right? That's when she gets a bit scared, and we have oh, to. Oh, I see. Yeah, I we see. have You're to. We're trying to train her without the walker. Yeah, because of the coordination and balance, because she gets a bit shaky. I see. Okay, but in terms of um, function, where uh -huh. she, is she, we're trying to we're trying to score her based on what she uses most of the time, which would be the walker. Oh, okay. All right. Right. Yeah. So that one would be a a what a six. Well, or, a, no, because she still needs the standby. The helper. Yeah. That will still be a five. Eh? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions or clarification? Does that help? No. Okay. So right now, um, I thought at least if we can squeeze in one case study, then we can at least start to apply it. I have several others which I can email to everybody um, because this next session will really follow up and, on, and it will just be application. Um, I know that we didn't go through every single one of the 18 areas, but so I'm going to have to encourage you to do that reading on your own, uh, just to go through all of the different areas before our next FIM session, which is on June 19th, so that we can just basically work on all applications. So let's talk about this case study, Lauren. She's an 82-year-old male, or sorry, he is an 82-year-old male, with complaints of left-sided weakness in his arm and leg. Workup, including a CT scan and MRI, confirmed evidence of a right middle cerebral artery ischemic uh, CVA. The patient was placed on Coumadin with a cardiac workup. Echocardiogram revealed a less than 20% ejection fraction. Uh, a video fluoroscopic swallow study was completed, which showed mild difficulty in the oral and pharyngeal stages of swallow with trace aspirations. Past medical history is significant for a left total hip replacement in 1994 and degenerative joint disease. Prior to admission, Lauren lived with his family in a split-level apartment. He does not drive, relying instead on friends and family to assist with transportation and shopping. He enjoys playing cards and going to the movies and restaurants with friends. The discharge plan is to return home with his wife. Lauren is admitted to the rehab unit on a Friday afternoon at 6, and his functional assessment during the first three days on the inpatient rehab unit is as follows. So I think the thing to do right now is let's just discuss the areas that we've already talked about and because we've you know, kind of gotten into details with them, and then assign the different levels of where he is. So we talked about eating. Lauren is on a puree diet. He requires extra time to complete his meals. During breakfast and lunch, a helper cues Lauren to follow swallow precautions. However, in the evening, Lauren pockets food. The helper checks his mouth for pocketing of food on the left side and removes the food. So I know our OT has left, but what would you say the level is 
the FIM level for this patient on a scale of you know zero to seven? What would you rate this patient? Anyone have any ideas? And you know, let's go ahead and go through the decision tree if you need, you know. Anyone have any ideas of what level the patient would be on? Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, this patient uh, requires, uh, in my opinion, yes. um, requires supervision because uh, the patient is able to eat, yes. but uh, if he's not supervised, he pockets the food. Right. And uh, requires assistance to, to, to remove the food. So I'll give that patient a uh, five. So five would be that they... No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Okay, require three, sorry. <laughs> so... I'm, I'm being heckled here. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. So the difference between... I think, <laughs> I think I have a different opinion from me now. Okay. Okay, I think the patient is actually, from my point of view, I think we will, I will give the patient a minimal assistance because the patient is able to chew and yeah. um, only needs assistance. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, sorry, only needs assistance with the food pockets on the left side. So the the, the help actually just assists uh, to get the food out of the of the cheek. Huh? Right. So I think a uh, minimal assistance would be better. correct because yeah. it, the patient you know, is able to do 75% of the work, it's just the pocketing, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, let's go ahead and go to, um, I'm just going to go down to another one that we've talked about, which is transfers bed to chair. Okay, so Lauren did not transfer out of bed on day one. Over the next two days, Lauren rolled on his left side, sat up, scooted forward, and transferred from a bed to a wheelchair with moderate lifting assistance from a helper. When transferring back to bed, Lauren requires maximal assistance, especially in the evening when he is tired and fatigued. So what level would you give him for this transfer from bed to wheelchair? Or sorry, you know, from bed, chair, wheelchair. What level would you give him? Okay, Irene, was that two that you uh, suggested? This is uh, <laughs> You're absolutely correct. It is level two maximum assistance because he requires moderate level assistance, level three from the bed to the chair, but then maximum assistance to get back into bed. So you're absolutely right. You would score the lower score, level two. Very mm -hmm. nice. Um, let's go ahead and try and do one more that we've discussed, locomotion. All right? So, uh, during therapy, Lauren ambulated 40 feet with assistance from his therapist for advancing his left leg. Initially, Lauren was unable to maneuver his wheelchair around the nursing unit, so a helper pushed him to therapy. By day three, Lauren wheeled himself on the nursing unit about 100 feet. The physical therapist expects that Lauren will ambulate by discharge. Okay. So what would you rate Lauren? You know, and a hint is that, you know, the physical therapist expects Lauren to walk by discharge. So what would you rate him currently? Currently. Moderate assistance. And another hint is taking a look at the distance. So he's ambulating. Oh, sorry. No, he expects he will. 
adulate by D0, but by D3, he is able to wheel himself on the nursing unit about 100. Okay, anyone have any idea? Probably, yeah. Mm, probably, uh, okay. I was thinking probably a three. Okay, so here's the hint. Um, <laughs> the hint is that he is um, walking less mm -hmm. than 50 feet. Mm -hmm. So what would he be right now? It's less than 50 feet. So if you make your way down the decision tree. Delimited 40 feet with assistance from his therapist. You know the thing is because now we don't have that a chart to refer to. Yeah. <laughs> Nishi, you're having a challenge because you don't have that chart to refer to. Oh, like all right. So let me put that chart up. Hold on. Just yes. 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 So yes. Let me do that. Let's mm -hmm. see. Let's see how the chart is. Was no yeah. Was less than fifty feet. Huh? Yeah. Two. Mm hmm. At two, Papa. It can't. It can't be. Mm -hmm. Maximal assistance. Maximal so this patient is willing. Is willing. Willing himself. But less than. So I'm willing to put it with assistance from his therapist. This then. Nishi, can you increase the font, please? You bet. Okay, is this better? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pal, do you want to talk through the decision tree? Can you see? Yeah, that's uh, okay. That's okay. That's better now. Does that help at all? Sorry. So the question is, you know, does the patient need help to walk 150 feet or 50 meters? So the answer is yes, right? So you would already go down to the helper section. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sal, so, do you want to keep going or do you want me to? To walk a minimum of 50. Yes. Then? Yes. Less than 50 feet. Does the patient walk less than 50 feet? Exactly. Sorry, I was on mute again. I'm sorry. Um, less than 50. The patient is walking less than 50. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So does the patient walk a minimum of 50 feet with the assistance of only one helper? So the answer is no, right? Yeah. He doesn't. And so the question is, does the patient walk less than 50 feet or is the assistance of two persons required for ambulation? And so what's the answer to that? Does he walk less than 50 feet? 
with assistance from therapists. He has assistance from Correct. the therapist? Yeah, so he does. He walks 40 so feet, right? Yes, yes, he walks 40 so, feet. So I think the key here is don't get uh, so uh, confused with the assistance. First, just go with the distance. So can he walk 50 feet or less than 50 feet? And then if you have an answer to that question, that'll lead you to the number. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 But you see, here we've not been told whether he has assistance of two people or one. So he has only one. Yes. Okay. In this case, in this case, it's really important for the walking to just start with the distance. Um, so the very first question in your mind should be, what is the distance that they're walking? If the answer is less than 50 meters, sorry, less than 50 feet, then we're going to go straight down to either it's going to be a 1 or a 2. Right? The answer to your question is, is he walking less than 50 feet? And the answer is yes, so the, the number will be 1. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then if he has, if the, the, the person is walking less than 50 feet and has only one, uh, one person. It's still less assist. than 50 feet, so it's still a number yeah. one. It's one so it's still assist. one. Yeah. yeah, it's still one. It, don't get confused with the number of persons. In this case, okay. it's or. So let's okay. say they were walking more than 50 feet, but they had two people assisting them, then that score would also be one. But one. in this case, in this case study, they're walking less than 50 feet, so it's a one automatically. Is that clear, or are you still confused about the assistance? It's clear. It's clear. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. We are kind of nearing our time where we need to wrap up for today, but I, um, I would like the next session to really focus the entire session on case studies. And so while we only covered a few areas, um, I really would like you each to read excuse me, the manual that's been presented um, that's on the email, uh, it's the, your discipline specific areas so that we can just focus on case studies. So I have a bunch of case studies here, but I think what would be a lot more helpful is if each person can just come with a current patient that they have or a previous patient that they had um, and you know describe where they are and that we can all work together to assign levels. Does, does that sound OK? Yes, 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 that's fine. Okay, wonderful. And, um, you know, if you can even just, uh, we can, you can even drop me a quick email as to your patient and I can, you know, compile the list of uh, patients so that we can go through it. That would be wonderful. And again, like I said, I have a bunch as well, so we can do that as well. And I would suggest if you have a patient that's difficult, like the outpatient you just talked about, um, and you have a question about how to assign, or maybe you can practice on a few patients and some of them might be really easy in getting through the decision tree, but if you have any patients that, you know, you really can't decide what number, those are good ones to bring to us next time so that we can help you make those decisions. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, just a friendly reminder that the follow-up to this session is not until June 19th, but we have another session on June 5th. Um, with Dr. Sawani um, on just putting it together for EKG. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nishi. Pleasure. Have a good evening.
Okay, I hope you enjoy. I, I hope you enjoyed having my ladies around. <laughs> yes, they're a pleasure. Are you kidding me? That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. 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 <coughs>